Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Sechas Shkalem DAF Tes Zayin discusses the Aron that was in the Beis HaMikdash. It discusses the Shem and HaMishcha, the oil that was used to anoint the Mishkan, the Kalim, the Kohen Gadol, and the Kings. And then he goes back to the Aron to discuss its actual sizes, how it was built, and what was inside it, and how it was arranged. Along the way, it'll talk about some of the kings of Israel and Yehuda, and um, who they were, what their names actually were, and some rules about anointing kings. So first of all, we're discussing the hiding of the Aron, what happened when the base of was about to be destroyed, where was it placed. And the Gemara now says that there were a number of things that were hidden along with it when it was hidden, and those were the things that were kept in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the container of Mun that was stored there, the bottle of the Shem and HaMishcha, the flask of Shem and HaMishcha, the oil that was used to anoint everything, the stick, the staff of Aaron HaKohen that flowered and grew walnuts, grew almonds in the time of Korach, when the dispute with Korach happened, Hashem asked them each to put their stick near the... Aaron and the one that would flower would be the one that he's choosing, and Aaron's flowered, and that stick is still there. Um, it was hidden along with the Aaron. And the last thing was a box which they got from the Polishtim. Now, when the Aaron was captured in war by the Polishtim, it caused a lot of problems for the Polishtim. They had a lot of health issues. So they returned it along with a carbon ashram of some sort. They sent a few um, figurines made from gold to serve as a carbon ashram of some sort, and those were kept next to the Aron, and those went into hiding along with the Aron when it was hidden. Now, the Gemara says, who hid it? It was hid by Yoshio HaMelech. Yoshio was one of the last kings. He was trying to restore Kla Yisrael to Tshuva. When he took office, Kla Yisrael was steeped in Avodah Zarah, and he found the Sefer Torah. And he opened it up, and he saw that it was rolled to the Tochacha, and he said, uh, I'm going to try to return everyone. And he got everybody back to do tshuva. However, he did find the Pasuk that said, Yelech Hashem Aizcha Vez Malkacha, Asher Taka Malacha, Gaya Shaloya Da'ata Atava, Vesach Hashem will take you and the king, which you will put upon you to a nation that you don't know and your fathers don't know. And he realized there's going to be a destruction, there's going to be an exile. And he said, I don't want the Aaron to go and take us along with it. So he decided to hide it. What did he do? He called the Levium. As the Pasuk in Divrei Yamim says, He called the Levim and he said to them, Put the Aaron in the house that was built by Shlomo, the son of David, king of all Yisrael. You don't need to carry it on your shoulders anymore. Now, what was he saying? He was saying, take it and put it in a hidden chamber that was prepared by Shlomo to hide the Aaron when the Chorban will come. He wasn't saying put it back in the base of Migdash. He would have called it base Hashem. And besides, it was already in the base of Migdash. He was telling them to hide it. And he told them to do that because, Im Gailahu, as the rest of the Pesukim describe, Im Gailahu, Imachem, if the Aaron goes in the gulls with them, Lebovel, Ain Atem Achzir, and Oisa Odom Kem, you'll never get it back. And therefore, you'll do other uh, avoda that you can do, but the Aaron should go into hiding at this point. Okay, now the Gemara discusses the Shem and That was the oil we mentioned that went into hiding along with the Aaron. How is the Shem and made? So the Psukim describing it say, it should be, what should it be? Besamim Roish. Should be incense, spices, more It should be 500. 500 means 500 shkalim weight. The word shekel, although it's used for money, is actually a weight. A weight of 500 shkalim. Kimon besem Half of that should be the cinnamon spaced, fry, spiced, fry, fragrant cinnamon. Should be half of that amount, which is 250 shekel. Um. Uh, you should have kinei voisem, that's another spice, chamishim is another 250 check out. You should have kida chamishim is another 500 of a spice called kida. And all this is b'shekel. Kedush, it ends off in the Pasuk. Adding it all together, you had 500, 500, 250, and 250. It adds up to 1,500 check out of spices. That's the way. Now, this was all meant to be mixed into oil or soaked in oil. And the oil was one hin, which is 12 loig. So the Gemara says, what happened with it exactly? The Gemara says, according to Rabbi Meir, it was cooked 
in the oil. Because the bihidu was first cooked in water in order that it should become saturated and not absorb any of the oil that happens later. And then it was cooked in the oil. Now, in the Bavli, it says it wasn't cooked, it was uh, soaked. But the fragrance of these spices would eventually get into the oil. It was the roots of the plant that was actually put in the oil. And it was, uh, the fragrance would get into the oil, and then there was the oil was removed and put into a flask, and that was the Shemana Mishcha. That's what was used for all the Mishcha. Now the Gemara brings the Brisa, Rabbi Yehuda Bey Rabbi Eloi, Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eloi. He says the Shemana Mishcha, which was made by Moshe Ben in the Midbar, was the only time the Shemana HaMishcha was made. It was used for all eternity. And if you think about it, he says, it was miracles from beginning to end. There was not enough oil there to actually put on all the roots without it all getting absorbed into the roots and it disappearing. It doesn't uh, scientifically add up. There was too many roots. There was 1,500 shekel worth of roots. And there was only one hin, 12 lugin, of oil. It's about a gallon or two of oil. So... um, it was miraculous that there was enough oil to go in all the roots and to still be scraped off. And besides that, it was boiled, so some of the oil was lost to the fire. Some of it was absorbed in the wood. Some of it was absorbed into the pot that it was in. And yet, there was still Shavon HaMishcha left. Not only was the Shavon HaMishcha left, there was enough to anoint all the kalim, the Shulchan and all its sub-utensils, the Menorah and all its sub-kalim, the Mishkan and all its kalim, Aaron, Akayin, and all his, his sons... Throughout the Shemesi May Miluim, the seven days of inauguration, they were anointed with it every day of the seven days. There was still enough for all that, and there was still going to be enough in the times of Mashiach. There was no other Shaman of Mishcha made at any point, and uh, it was also used to anoint the kings of Yisrael, and uh, this is all miraculous that there was enough oil for this, and that is the miracles that he is describing over here. Now, the Gemara goes deeper into the lachas of anointing the kings of Yisrael. So the Gemara says, Halacha, a king has to be anointed by a spring of water. When you appoint a king of Yisrael, he has to be anointed by pouring oil on his head. That should be done next to a spring of water, like the Torah says, by the anointing of Shlomo Melech. He rode on a mule, it was taken down to the Gichon spring, which is a spring just outside Yerushalayim. He was anointed by Tzadik the Kohen Gadol and Nasan the Navi as king on Israel. So you see the description of Shlomo being anointed at the spring. So all kings should be anointed at the spring. It's a symbolization of the permanence and the long term of their rulership. Now the Gemara says not all kings were anointed. Only kings that were the first in their line were anointed. A king whose father was a king before him is not anointed. He does inherits the kingship automatically from his father. Shlomo Melech was an exception to that. We shall see why. This is different than Kohanim Gedolim. Kohanim have to become anointed each anew, even if their father and ten generations of kings of uh, fathers before them were all Kohen Gadol, they all have to be anointed anew. Now, where do you see that you don't anoint the uh, king if his father was a king? So, you see that from David HaMelech. When he was anointed, it said, Hashem said to Shmuel, Kol Mishachayu ki zehu, this is the one. This is the one, and not his son. His son is going to be king without being anointed, but you should anoint this one. Now, Shlomo was anointed anyway. Why? That's because there was a machlokis. Whenever there's a dispute as to who becomes king, or there's some reason that we need to publicize it loudly and clarify who the real king is, then we anoint him even if his father was a king. And the Gemara brings a couple of examples of that. Shlomo was a good example of that because Adonai Yo, who was his half-brother, was trying to steal the kingship from him. It was a whole uh, operation to get Kai Yisrael to understand that Shlomo was the king, not Adonai Yo, in order to prevent um, any mistakes, Shlomo was anointed anyway. Now, Yoash, Yoash was anointed even though he was the son of Achazia, who was king. And the reason he was anointed is because his grandmother, Atalia, had killed everybody, and she appointed herself the queen. Yoash was hidden in the Kodesh Gedashim for six years. So in order to uh, publicize that he had returned, and his grandmother, Atalia, was gone, uh, he was anointed. So he had a anointing procedure. Now, Yehoachaz, who was the son of Yoshio, Melch Yehuda, he was also anointed, and that's because he was the younger brother of Yehoiakim, uh, Yaakov was two years older than him, and to make it clear that even though he's the younger brother, he's the one who's becoming king, he had to have an anointing. And also says that Yehu, Yehu was anointed, and that was because there was a dispute with Yoram. 
Yehiram was trying to take over the kingship, and Yehu, this is Malchi Yisrael, these two, they had to be, uh, so Yehu had to be anointed. Now, the Gemara asks, how could Yehu be anointed? Yehu was a Melch Yisrael. At some point, the kingship of Christ all split. There's the kingdom of Yehuda and the kingdom of Yisrael. The kingdom of Yisrael wasn't anointed. We see that because the same apostle we said before, Kum Kisehu, this is the one who's anointed. Only Malchai Beis David are going to be anointed, not other kings. So Gemara says, good kasha, and I'll show you another kasha. How are you, how are you telling me that Yeho Achaz was anointed before Yeho Yakim? Didn't you just tell me that Yeshe Yo hid the Shevon Amishcha? So Yeshe Yo was his father. So it was gone already by the time he he died, and they were un- anointing a son of his. So Gemara says, these two anointings were not Shevon Amishcha. These two anointings were just using Shevon Afar Simon, uh, balls of oil, in order to do an anointing, but it was not a real anointing with Tisham and Amishcha. Okay, more Allah is about the anointing of kings. You have to do it from a horn. You should fill up an animal horn with the um, oil and pour it from there. You should not use a regular flask, and the reason is that flasks break, and it symbolizes a very short-term kingship. You should use a horn, which is much more long-term, it has more longevity, and symbolizes a kingship that has more lasting effect. So, uh, the Psukim actually describe that David HaMelech and Shlomo HaMelech were anointed from a horn, and that's why their kingship lasted. On the other hand, Shaul and Yehu, they were anointed from a flask, uh, earthenware flask, and that's why their kingship did not last. It actually was very short-term. Shaul was only king for two, two and a half years. Okay, says the Gemara further, more halachas, you cannot make a Kohen into a king. A Kohen is not allowed to be a king. And we have two sources for that, two psukim. One is what by Rabbi Yuda Antudaria, Antundaria, who says, it says, Lo Yosher Shevet Mi Yehuda. Yaakov said to Yehuda that you are going to have all the kingships. The staff of rulership will not leave Yehuda. So it can't go to anybody else. Besides for Benjamin. But once it went to Yehuda, from after the first time there was a king in Yehuda, it can't go to anybody else. Now, other Pasuk is, The Pasuk in Devarim says that there will be king will have a long reign in Israel. And right afterwards, talking about something else, but it's very much juxtaposed, it says, it can't, it, It's referring to that they won't have a Yerusha, but right after discussing king, it says, There won't be any kings which will be Kehanim and Levim, is the implication. Okay, the Gemara goes back to discuss the specific kings. The Gemara brings the Pasuk that says who the sons of Yeshio were. So it says, Abachar Yochanan, the oldest was Yochanan, Asheni Yehu Yochim, Ashlishi Tzid Kiyo, Harvi Shalom. So the order was Yeshi, uh, the order of the sons of Yeshio was Yochanan, Yehu Yochim, Tzid Kiyo, and Shalom. So the Gemara says, Yehu Ochaz is not mentioned. Yehu Ochaz is another name of Yochanan. But says, how could that be? You just told me earlier Yehu Ochaz was the younger brother of Yehu Yochim. How are you telling me he's Yochanan? This Pasuk clearly says, Yochanan is the Bukhar, he's the oldest. The Gemara says, not the oldest. When we say Bukhar, we mean he was the first to rule, even though he's not the oldest. Next, the Gemara says that uh, Shalom and Sidkiyo are the same person. Gemara says Shalom and Sidkiyo are the same person. It says Sidkiyo was third son and uh, Shalom was the fourth son. Gemara says it means that he was the third um, son to be born, but he was the fourth son to rule. Of these four that are mentioned, he was the fourth that actually took office because he was after Yeho Yachaz, Yeho Yachim, Yeho Yachin. And Yehoiachin's own son, who was actually Tzitkiyo's nephew, who was Yehoiakim. Tzitkiyo came after his own nephew, and he was the fourth in the family of descendants of Yeshio to serve as a king. He was also the last king. Now, the Gemara says, uh, why was his name called Tzitkiyo? Why did he get the name Tzitkiyo? Because he was Tzidek Midesadin. He justified a Baruch Hu's strict judgment against him and the suffering that he was put through. Why was he called Shalom? Because it was shal- it was shal- it was the Shlemos. It was the end. Shoma. It was the end of Machal's base. David, at least until Mashiach comes. Now, Reish Lakish says that his name wasn't really Shalom or Tzidkiyo. His real name was Matanya. He was given the name Tzidkiyo by Nebuchadnezzar when he installed him as king after removing Yehoiakim from his position as king. Okay, the Gemara now goes back to discussing the sizes and the measurements of the Aron and how they were actually laid out. Now, the Aron we know measured two and a half Amos by one and a half Amma. Gemara has a machlokis tanoim, what type of amma this was. There were three sizes of amma. And based on that machlokis, we also have a machlokis what fit into it. If it was a smaller aron using smaller ammos, 
than the Sefer Torah that was in the Kodesh Kedashim and near there and didn't fit inside. So the Gemara says as follows. Rabbi Meir says it was a six tefach amal, and he derives it from a pasuk which indicates that the amal that was used was the medium sized amal. That's a six tefach amal of tightly closed fingers. Um, it's the middle sized amal. He says that actually all the amas were middle sized amals. So this is Rabbi Meir again, who says that all the Amos in the Beis Hamikdash, including the Kalim, which includes the Aron, were six tefach Amma, and that is disputed by Rabbi Yehuda, who says that the building of the Beis Hamikdash and the Mishkan itself used six tefach Amos, but the Kalim, which include the Aron, used five tefach Amos. Each Amma is only five tefachim. And the Gemara proceeds to describe Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Shlakish, Each one describes one of the opinions describes how it looked. So Rabbi Yochanan explains Rabbi Meir, and he says as follows, there was a six tefach amos, so therefore, two and a half amos of six tefach amos comes to fifteen amos, that is the uh, fifteen tefachim, fifteen tefachim, again, it's two and a half times six is fifteen, and the width of the Aron was one and a half amos, that comes to nine tefachim. Now, the thickness of the walls, according to this, was half a tefach, that means that along the length subtracting half a tefach on each end, you end up with 14 tefachim space. And you had to fit in in there the four luchos, the two of the first set, which are broken, the two of the second set, which are broken. That's four luchos. And according to Rabbi Meir, you're also going to have room for this safer Torah. Now, how was it laid out? So along the length, you had set side by side the luchos themselves. The luchos were three amos thick and six amos wide, and uh, also six amos uh, uh, six tefachim, sorry, they were three tefachim wide, three tefachim thick, and three tefachim, and six tefachim long. So they were laid side by side on their three tefach side, so therefore they added up to a total of twelve tefachim, three times the four luchos is twelve tefachim. Remember we said there was fourteen tefachim inside the box, and therefore that left two tefachim for the Sefer Torah that was put in the Aron to fit, and according to Rabbi Meir, it was indeed inside the box. Now along the width of the box, the, lua, the luchos were six tefachim long, and they were put widthways into the box, sideways into the box of the Aron. Uh, the entire width of the Aron was nine tefachim. Half a tefach for the walls on each side leaves you with eight tefachim. Six tefachim were taken up by the Aron. That leaves an extra tefach on each side of the Aron for a total of two extra for, uh, f- on each side of the luchas within the Aron. And that gave you some wiggle room in order to be able to take out the Sefer Torah when it was removed to be read from, which was on uh Yushanim, when, but possibly on Hakel um, or on Yom Kippur. Now, this is all going to be mayor. According to Rabbi Yehuda, a tefach, the, the amos of the urn were only five tefachim. That means that the two and a half amos measured twelve and a half tefachim. Uh, two and a half times five is twelve and a half. And the one and a half amma width was seven and a half tefachim. In this, we had to fit the luchos, and therefore there was no room for the Sefer Torah. Again, the luchos were laid side by side. That is three tefachim. The three tefachim uh, side by side, it takes up a total of 12 tefachim. Uh, the thickness of the walls was a quarter of a tefach each, and that uses up all the space. There's no extra, that adds up to 12 and a half tefachim, it all fit exactly. Now the width, you had 7 and a half tefachim for the 6 tefachim of the luchos, plus a quarter tefach each for the wall, that leaves you for an extra ama half a tefach on each side to give you some wiggle room to move around the luchos should the need arise, and this is how it was all worked out. Now, the Gemara just brings Psukim to prove that the broken luchos were also put in the Aron, and it's from the Pasuk that says, um, Asher shibarto v'samtom ba'aron. It says, uh, you should take the broken ones and put them in the Aron. There you see that the broken ones also had to be within the Aron and the Gemara also brings the Psukim to show the size of how much each uh, length, each dimension of the Aron was meant to be. The Gemara now describes how the Aron was made itself. So we're trying to figure out what the Pasuk means when it says, Vitsipisa, I say, Zahav Tahar, you should cover it with gold, pure gold. On the inside and the outside, you should cover it. And then there was a kapara set to go on top. So the main box was made out of wood, the box of the iron. It was, again, without the cover on, it was a five-sided box. 
of wood, four sides on the bottom. And it was covered with gold, and it says twice, cover it with gold, and then with gold you should, uh, it says, Vitsipiza says the hub, and then me buy some chutz tetzapenu. So, why is there this repetition? So, the Gemara has a machokis, how you understand that. The Gemara calls it Bichani to bring them Leo. says they made three boxes. The main one was of wood, and then a smaller one of gold fit just inside it, and a larger one of gold had the wooden one placed into it. So, it was three layers. And he took the kaporis and covered it up. And that kaporis covered the wooden square that was visible from the top. And that's the meaning of the extra titzapenu, that the kaporis should cover up the wood on the top surface. Now Rish Lakish disagrees. He says he actually, all that happened was that he took a wooden box and he overlaid it with a plating of gold. That's the meaning of itzipisa, says the haftar. The extra titzapenu is to tell you that you have to cover up the seams, the cracks. Possibly, as a machlok uh, and what that means, possibly just the seams between the wood should be covered with a smooth, un, uh, unseamed, unlined layer of the gold, or possibly it means that even the edges where the, where the planks of wood meet should have gold between, meaning each board that makes up the box should be made, should be covered with the gold all around on all the sides. Okay, the Gemara now discusses the Luchais. How did the Luchais work? So we know that there were 10 Dibros, the Saras of Dibros, and they were written on the Luchais. So the Gemara brings four opinions as to how many Dibros actually appeared on the Luchais. Rabbi Hanina Ben Gamil says it was five on each. There were 10 altogether. It says, He wrote the 10 on the two Luchais, five on each. Now the Gemara brings the Rabbanon that say, no, there were 10 on each, because the Pesach says, V'yageid l'chem ez b'risei sh'etzi v'eschem l'asais aseres ha'devarim. He said the 10 things. V'yech deveim al shnei luchas on. That means he wrote each of the 10 things on each luach, and therefore there were 10 on each. According to some opinions, one was the 10 that are spelled out in Parshas Yisroi, and one of the 10 from Parshas V'aschanan. Now the third opinion is Roshim Ben Yichai says there were 20 on each, and his pasuk is Yechtevei Moshe Luchas Zavanim Esr Meluach Zev Esr Meluach Zei. Says it says you should write them on the luchos, which means twenty on each. Uh, the mafarshim have some difficulty seeing this in the pasuk anywhere. Where does it say twenty on each? The gra actually changes what the pasuk is. He changes the girsa. Um, some want to say that the fact that it says this pasuk twice says is to show that it were both written, there were two sets of the writing, and they were both written, therefore it's 20 altogether, 20 on each. The last opinion is Avasim who says that there were 40 on each, each loch is written four times, like it says, on this side and this side, that it's written, that means it's squared, and is written four times on each of the four sides of the luchos. Okay, Umaris is more about the Luchais, that between the letters of the Aseris the Dibrais, you had spelled out all the mitzvahs of the Torah, possibly the Rabbanons, as well written in tiny letters between the big letters of the Aseris the Dibrais. And the Umara derives this from the Apostle says, Mimuloim Batarshish, it's filled up like the sea, like the ocean of Tarshish, which is another name for the Mediterranean, the Yamatichon. Now, says Rish Lakish, when I got to this Pasuk Mimuloim by Tarshish, I said, wow, such a great pshat that was told over to me by Hanania, Menachi Rabbi Yeshua, uh, that explained it in that way. Because just like the ocean, just like the ocean has big waves with a lot of little waves between them, little ripples, say, similarly, the Luchais had big letters, the Aseris Adibros, and a lot of little waves, a lot of little letters, instructions of the other mitzvahs between them, which are also included in the Aseris Adibros. All right, now the Gemara goes back to the discussion of Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Meir. We had seen that as a Mahalikas between Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Meir, if the Sefer Torah was actually inside the Aroin or not. So the Gemara says, what is the source for each of them? So, so the Gemara brings Psukim. The Gemara says, according to Rabbi Yehuda, that says that the Sefer Torah was not in the Aroin, uh, he learns it from a Pesach in Dvarim that says, You take it and put it on the side. So you put it nearby. There was a box that was connected to, attached to the Arn, and the Sefer Torah was in there. It was not in the Arn itself. 
And that uh, fits very well with his opinion that there wasn't enough room for it. Now, the Gemara does not explain how Rabbi Meir would answer or explain that Pasuk, but he says Rabbi Meir has his own Pasuk, and that's that it says, Venasata el kaporas, Venasata es kaporas al haron mamalo. You put the cover on the aron, Venasa aron titain, Venel ha aron titain, Esa edus esher etin halacha. And inside the aron, you put the edus. Now, what is this edus? This edus has got to refer to the Sefer Torah, because the Luchas were already in there. So Gemara says, it comes out that the Torah is written here out of order. Within one Pasuk, it's out of order, because it says, put the cover on, and then put the Aaron, and then put the Sefer Torah in. you got to first put the Sefer Torah in, and then put the cover on. So it's written out of order. According to um, Rabbi Meir, possibly you could say that it's referring to the Luchas, which were already in there, but according to Rabbi Huda, it's got to be put on. Okay. Now, the Gemara quotes... A final statement from Pinchas in the name of Hashem and Beish Lakish says that the Torah which HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to Moshe was written with fire. It was white fire. It was black fire inscribed on white fire. And it is made out of ash. It's mixed of its mixed fires. It's chiseled from ash. It's given in a fire. Like it says, Mi minoi ash das lamai. The Torah is Drive the Daft is a project of the Grand Woodland Shul and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaft at gmail.com.